Okay, so finally, this is the one that y'all been waiting for. This is the one where we talk about the money. When it comes to the how to quit your job and travel the world, this is definitely one of the biggest blockers for most people, and in a lot of ways, this is where most people just stop. Part three, baby. It's all about the money. <laughs> so in this one, we're going to talk about everything in as much honesty and as much detail as we possibly reasonably can about how we went from having this idea of, yes, we want to take a trip around the world and it's going to cost approximately 35000 how we went from having $0 saved up for this trip all the way to $35,000. And it's at this point in this YouTube video and every other YouTube video that talks about money where I have to say that we are not financial experts. It's not what we're here for. We're not really giving financial advice. We're not here to tell you necessarily what you should do, but we're telling you what we did so that maybe it'll help you do what you got to do. Just in case you're sitting out there wondering like who are these people and how do they possibly know about this thing that they're about to tell me about, which is a fair question and yeah. one you should ask before watching any YouTube video. We're Lisa and Josh. Hi, and... I'm Lisa. <laughs> this is Josh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've quit my job to travel the world four different times. We're on the fourth time of me doing this right now. And I quit my job two years ago with the plan of taking this one year trip and we're on month nine now. So if you watch the first two videos, the first one was really like, do you want to quit your job and travel the world? And if you watch that video and still at the end of it, you were like, yes, this is for me. Then the second video was, how much is this thing gonna cost? How much is my trip, the dream that I have, how much is that gonna cost? For us, it was $35,000. And at that point in time, we had zero saved up for it. So we're gonna split up this video into two different parts. The first is gonna be our story, everything that we did to go from zero dollars saved for this trip up to being able to be on this trip right now after leaving our jobs. And then the second part is gonna be a Q&A. We've accumulated a ton of questions from all of you over the past couple of weeks. Thank you for commenting and leaving those questions because we think they're super, super valuable. And in the case that you find any of this helpful or at least lightly entertaining, <laughs> feel free to hit that subscribe button and you'll get notified of our next video. Yeah, because at 100,000 subscribers, we're gonna literally give away a trip around the world for free to one of you out there. So our origin story, if you will, <laughs> it was 2017. Do we mean 2017? That sounds right. We met on an ice climbing trip, but that wasn't actually, you know, the start of our journey. Yeah. Josh was on a around the world trip. I was working in the Bay Area. No, no, no. <laughs> then we reconnected in 2018 and one of the things that we both really wanted to do was travel more. Flash forward after a couple of big trips together like New Zealand, Taiwan, Thailand, we decided to get married. And in that time frame we started <laughs> and in planning our futures together one of the things that we were most excited for was planning our honeymoon. We were sitting on our couch spreadsheet pulled up of course listing out all the places that we wanted to go visit but the thing that was constraining us was the idea of two to three weeks for a vacation yeah. and i sat there and i turned to josh and i said what if we take a whole year and of course you know his answer yeah yeah i had never been more sure that i was ready to marry someone <laughs> until that moment right there. <laughs> then we knew we had a goal. We only had one major problem and that was that we had literally zero dollars <laughs> saved up. So we were starting at zero and the intention was to not work at all during this entire trip. Obviously uh, <laughs> that's changed because you know we're making YouTube videos but our plan was not to keep a job, to work remotely, to do anything like that as we were traveling or even pick up jobs as we were traveling which are all options to be able to sort of extend your trip and go longer but for us it's just, it's just not the type of experience that we wanted to have that changed a lot <laughs> yeah yeah and to be clear neither of us was or is rich at this point in time i mean we're on the youtuber salary that is just the saddest looking thing where our best hope for this thing is that someday we can afford health insurance uh, <laughs> we weren't using other people's money to do this this was just our money that we had to set aside over a long period of time. The first thing that we had to do was just sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Isn't just make a lot of changes in our life to cut back our spending and 
sell basically everything that we owned that we didn't need. <laughs> we canceled a bunch of our subscriptions that we weren't using anymore. We stopped going out to eat all the time. We started bringing lunch into work every single day. We started doing meal prepping. Josh was in charge of packing lunch today. What you got? For some reason, Lisa thought that I might have bought too many green beans, but I disagree. What a deal, $7 for five pounds of green beans. So we're having green beans for lunch? And for the rest of our lives. Are these even clean? I don't know. You don't wash them? We cut back from our fancy Verizon cell phone plan to one of those like kind of weird, really cheap cell phone plans. Rather than taking Uber and Lyft everywhere, we started taking public transportation more often. We bought a used cheap car so we can get around for any of those long haul trips that we needed to take. And don't get us wrong, we definitely had some room for flexibility. We still saw our friends. Rather than going out to an expensive meal or going out to a fancy show, we invited our friends over. Rent was super expensive, so we ended up taking on a roommate and that cut our costs in half. We even bought a whiteboard so we can draw and keep track of our budget. We also took a look at every single thing that we were spending our money and time on. So we use things like mint.com. We use spreadsheets. We use the spreadsheet that we have down below. It's linked down below if you want to use it that just kind of outlines all the areas that you would spend money in. It takes like 10 minutes to fill out. Just fill it out and then it'll tell you exactly where all your money's going. And then you can start figuring out, like we did, where you can cut back. And for us, it was basically every single category. We checked in with each other every single week to see, okay, what did we spend money on today? It became really, really fun. Fun. <laughs> Friend. Friend. <laughs> this change in your life, no matter how much you need to save up for it or how long you're planning on going, it needs to become the obsession. It needs to become the only goal, the only thing. And everything else just needs to kind of fall to the wayside except for just saving up for this one thing because the thing that you're trying to do is change your life. We also sold a lot of our possessions just to add to our travel bank. And all of this was just based on the thought that when we were in Thailand, like sipping a coconut after scuba diving, that we're not gonna be sitting there being like, huh, I really miss my air fryer. Which we sold for $40 on Craigslist, by the way. <laughs> so I know that all of you out there are gonna have very, very different circumstances than the one that we have, but the only perspective that we can truly share is, is our own. And I would urge you, instead of thinking of all the barriers and all the ways that this could go wrong and all the things that you have to sacrifice, try to focus more on what you're gonna get once you actually make this happen. This is just like any other kind of big audacious goal is that, yes, there are sacrifices required and you gotta put in the time and the work to make it happen, but I promise you, on the other side of this thing, it's totally, totally worth it. So we know we just threw out a bunch of things that you kind of just haphazardly because we love this topic. <laughs> But I would say the top things that we did that really just changed this from a plan to reality was we decided exactly what our budget was and how much we needed to spend for a trip like this to happen. We determined the exact monthly cost that we needed to eat, buy groceries, pay for our cell phone bills, pay for our rent, and three, set up a separate account that we called The Dream, where we just started funneling all that extra money and savings into that specific account. Four, we set up we set up an actual physical reminder, our whiteboard with our funky, weird looking temperature thermometer budget goal tracker. It was very unfortunately short. <laughs> we just started to save extra money by selling things or any time that we decided not to go out to eat and instead put that money towards our goal. And one of the most important tips that sometimes we take for granted is share your goals with other people. Sometimes it can feel scary to share some of these these dreams, these big audacious plans because of fear of disappointment or judgment. But we encourage you to actually share this with your friends because it helped us actually work towards that goal. It kept us accountable. Your friends won't be able to help out or understand the thing that you're doing if you don't tell them about it. And you'll give them a reason to also save up so they can come and visit you. Yes, exactly. Let me give you some concrete examples of how this looks for a person in Atlanta making $55,000 a year. 55K annual salary is about $3,000 per person per month. So you multiply that by two and you got just over 6,000. And that number is after taxes, after contributing to your 401k, after paying for your health insurance, all of that, it's just your, your take home pay. You'd probably spend on average about $1,400 in rent for two people, $400 in groceries, $250 on restaurants, $90 on your phone, $50 on your internet for your place. 
$480 for transportation, whether this is your car or if you're taking public transportation. $700 on other stuff that's just specific to you. A $500 rainy day fund is in like just setting some money away in case your job goes away or something bad happens. And then the rest, that $700 between the two of you will go into your travel fund. And that might not sound like much, but after six months, you're gonna have $4,200. And after a year, you're gonna have $8,400, which is plenty for a three to four to maybe even five or six month trip in Southeast Asia for the two of you. So just after one year, you'd be able to take six months and go and do whatever you want in Southeast Asia. And if you do wanna speed this process of saving up for this trip even further, you can start by saving up just an arsenal of credit card points and frequent flyer miles like we did, which is not only paying for this $200 a night hotel room that you're seeing right here, but it saved us over $10,000 on just this trip alone across flights and a bunch of other things. It was a whole world that I did not know anything about, but I'm so, so glad for it now. So we actually have a course on Skillshare that teaches you all of this from top to bottom, how to save as much money as possible for your upcoming adventure using these credit card points and frequent flyer miles. If you do want to learn, there's a link down below for Skillshare. For the first thousand that click that link, you're going to get one month free of Skillshare, which is plenty of time to watch not only our course, but also a lot of the other amazing courses out there. Like right now, we're learning how to draw on our iPad using this weird Procreate app that we hate, but apparently it's good for drawing. And then I'm also learning how to code custom apps and spreadsheets. There's so much great stuff on there. It's awesome. Uh, the link is down below for Skillshare. Again, the first thousand that use it will get their first month free. Also, did we mention this, this $200 a night room? Yeah. We have five nights here free. And we know this this might be overwhelming and it can seem like a lot, yeah. a lot of sacrifices and a lot of spreadsheets. A lot of credit cards. <laughs> but because we did all of that work two years ago, we get to do all of this. We get to ride ATVs in Santorini. We get to take boat trips in Kobe P. We get to scuba dive in Koh Tao. We get to feed kangaroos at the Australia Zoo. We get to go visit all the hawker stalls in Singapore and see the gardens by the bay. There's so many experiences that we've gotten to have in a short nine months because of the, just the compact one year that we spent saving for this thing. What we're saying is that it's worth it and it's gonna be a pain. It might be annoying for like the 19th time in a row that you're eating some Costco rotisserie chicken and veggie thing because that's My all you bought. Meal. You Thank you very much. <laughs> it is great. There are some downsides to this, no doubt, but the upside is way, way, way worth the amount of sacrifices that you need to make. All right, that is enough about this. You guys are tired of hearing about us. So like, we just want to answer your questions. And we've gotten so many of these questions and we're so excited to go through them. Uh, where do we start? Where do we start? Let me pull up my spreadsheet. All right, so the first one, how did you decide what to pack? Mm -hmm. So, hold on, let me get mine. <laughs> let me get it. Almost ready, hold on. Okay, while he's doing that, I will explain about, hold on. I'll explain how I decided to pack. Because this person says, especially you, Lisa, we both decided that we wanted to be very minimalist and very practical on our trip. So that yeah. meant we're only carrying one backpack with us Everything at all times. Everything has to fit in here <laughs> or else it doesn't come with. We've both been on trips where we had so much extra baggage. <laughs> and both emotional and physical. <laughs> suitcases. <laughs> suitcases, rolly things, and I'll, I i got to say, Josh just hates the chick 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 Anyway, that's a separate Travel Thursday no, rant roll, opinion thing. Rolly suitcases should not be allowed anyway, anywhere. Nobody should use them. They're the worst. We just knew that we wanted to be able to grab and go at any time, and backpacks were the way to do that. So we both have 35 liter coat epoxy bags, and they are perfect and just what we need. Yeah, let me just grab my bag. Future Lisa, can you put some hold music here or something? Okay, here's my bag. I knew that we were gonna spend three months of our trip in Europe, so it was going to be a little bit warm. So I packed two pairs of pants, one pair of leggings, one pair of wide leg pants, and one pair of shorts, two t-shirts, two tank tops, one scarf actually that I bought in front of the Vatican because you know, shoulders. One dry towel, a rain jacket, coconut pour over. We only packed what we could fit into our backpacks and we based it based off of 
the weather and where we were going mostly. And I think the thing that I had to realize as we've been traveling is that you're not going to use all of the things that you started off with because this is a whole year and you're gonna purchase things along the way. Like our coconut pour over from Thailand that currently takes up 25% of my bag. Yeah, basically if you bring a backpack and there's nothing in it and the only thing you have are the clothes that you're wearing and your passport, you're gonna be just fine. That being said, we're gonna make a video soon that literally talks through why we decided to pack every single item that we bought and why we bought that individual items. How do you overcome fears of traveling to a new place or for traveling for a long time? Ooh, and for that's me, that's a really good question. These are two different, these are two very different questions, both of them really good. When you come back, everything is going to be different, especially if you've been gone for a year. You're gonna leave all of your friends, you're gonna leave all your family, and you're probably not gonna see them for a long time, even though you're keeping up the date on Facebook and Instagram or whatever, but even with all that, you're not really in the flow of everyday life, and you're gonna miss stuff. Like, you're gonna miss birth of your friend's kids or wedding. So for me, when I'm thinking about like being afraid of leaving for a long trip, it's not that. I'm never afraid of leaving for the long trip, I'm afraid of coming back home. Because that's the most emotionally difficult part. And that's the thing that I think that you need to spend more time thinking about. Like, how do you overcome these fears is to acknowledge them. It's to talk to your friends, it's to be as present as you possibly can in the time that you have with your friends and your family while you're still with them, while, while you're physically present. Because the thing that you're about to do is going to change you as a person. It's something that I struggled with a lot because I'm a person who loves routines. This was actually something that I felt like I was going to struggle the most with on the trip. On our trip, it became very important and very clear to me and to communicate to Josh that some routines are really important for me. So every morning I wake up and I, I journal. I have a cup of coffee before I do anything else. We both make sure to schedule in time to talk to our families and our friends so that way we feel a little bit of normalcy. And that way it makes it feel like this, this trip isn't all completely removed from our lives before this. But I think that for me, as I start like turning from like nine to five working Josh back into like full-time traveler Josh, is that I just get more comfortable with looking like an idiot in front of strangers. And I know that this is not probably the answer you're looking for, but it is truthfully the only way to really make it comfortable while you're traveling. Like, you're gonna go out to maybe Paris, maybe that's your first stop, and you're gonna try to order a baguette, and they're gonna be like, I don't know what you're saying. And you're gonna be like, well, I don't speak French, you don't speak English, so I'm just gonna like make a lot of gestures to be like, can I buy that bread? and I want one of them, <laughs> and how much does it cost? You're gonna look like an idiot while you're doing it, but you're still, you will have connected with another person that doesn't speak the same language as you at all, and it will be amazing. Once you actually get it done, and you actually get the bread, and the transaction's over, and everybody's happy, they say merci beaucoup, and you're like, yep, I definitely don't know what that means. <laughs> Once you go through that process a couple of times, it starts to feel really comfortable, because the onus is on you to make this whole thing work. You're walking into somebody else's house, somebody else's country. They speak a perfectly good language. You speak a very different language and you're trying to make a connection, but it's your job to absorb all the awkwardness of this situation into you to make this work. Along those lines, another question that came up was what are some of the things that you didn't expect mm -hmm. to come up on your trip? For me, the thing that was most surprising is how adaptable we've become. I was expecting to be so rigid in my comforts and my routines that this was actually gonna be very challenging for me. Sure, there are a lot of difficult parts about traveling long-term and traveling to foreign countries and not speaking the language, but it has been surprisingly refreshing to see how seamless we have fit into the idea of moving around from place to place and meeting new people being awkward being able to make connections with people that don't speak the same language as you i would say for me the unexpected thing that's been coming up especially a lot for us recently as we're now nine months deep into this trip is that we're starting to get homesick again all right Health insurance. This has been such a big topic. So many people have asked about this. What do we do for health insurance on this trip? How do we handle it? How much is it? How expensive is it? So if you check out in our link down in the description below, you can see what we use, which is Safety Wing. And this is a travel insurance that is good basically everywhere else on planet Earth except for the United States. And that's one of the major reasons why it's kind of cheap. 
and good for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Each of us pays $40 per month for this travel insurance and it basically covers us in case something awful happens and we need to go to the hospital for that. Or if we get in some sort of accident. Like we did in Thailand. <laughs> then it covers our medical expenses while we're there. So for some of you out there, if you look at Safety Wing and it's crazy expensive based on, you know, whatever special circumstances that you have, then shop around. There are plenty of other companies that do this. And it turns out with my parents coming over here in just a couple weeks that they were actually already covered by the insurance that they already had for traveling. So maybe look into that too. And another thing to keep in mind, especially for us as we came from the United States, is that we found that healthcare costs just a fraction everywhere else that we've been in the world as compared to what it costs back at home. The idea of going to see a provider or going to the hospital in a different country actually worried me. Mm -hmm. But after after doing just that, I, I honestly am not so afraid anymore. When we were in Thailand after a little scooter accident, I ended up going to see the doctor just to get a checkup and the entire office visit was $30 and they could tell me exactly how much it cost at the beginning and at the end. And is that health insurance a part of our budget currently? Yes, we include that in our full budget for the $35,000, that $80 per month that we spend between the two of us. This is my favorite question here. How did you make the decision to say, okay, I'm quitting my job to travel the world? And there's a bit more in this comment kind of talking about like, the hesitancy of that. There's a lot of variables here, right? And it's asking like, what do we do when we get back? Do we just start over? But this idea of starting over means that you would have somehow forgotten every skill that you had in your last job in just a year of traveling, which maybe you do, I don't know, but probably won't happen. The underlying thing through these questions is, yeah, just fear and uncertainty, <laughs> which 100% get. I was definitely afraid. I thought I was burning my career to the ground the first time that I left on a trip like this, but uh, personally, it was just the idea that I would have this regret for the rest of my life of there was this dream that I wanted to make happen. But for some reason, based on these fears that I didn't know if they were founded or not because I hadn't tested it yet. I didn't know if I could actually leave my job and quit it. But was that uncertainty big enough for me to never try in the first place? And for me, it was no, I had to try it. The thing that really just made me decide to make a change and decide that this was the path that we wanted to take was I was tired of writing in my journal every single day you know I have this journal that asks me what what is it what is the thing that you want to do most in life and it asks you the same question for five years and I had always written I want to travel and take photos travel and take photos travel and take photos and I was tired of not doing that. And yeah, I still get this little bit of fear that we're going to go back and we're going to be out of a job or not know what to do next. But even if we hadn't taken that trip, I think I would have always still wondered that question. There's always going to be some level of uncertainty with whatever path that we take. So the next question is, what sort of bank card do you use for ATM withdrawals? And this is a really good question with a very simple, straightforward answer. For those of you that live in the US, you can get the Charles Schwab Investor Checking Account. And the reason that this thing is great is because the debit card is a Visa Plus, and it says it right on the back of the card. I'd show it to you, but then you'd all, but then you'd all steal all my money. I know you would. We don't have a lot, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, there's not much in there anymore. So the reason that this debit card is great is because it's accepted in every single country that we've tested it on, and all of the ATMs, even in those super weird ones that are just at the 7-Elevens in Japan that are real finicky, you'll know what I'm talking about once you get there. And the best part is Schwab will reimburse you for any ATM ATM fees that come with withdrawing money, even international fees. It's yeah. pretty awesome. So do we use more than one credit card when they're traveling, like one more general one and then one airline one and then maybe a hotel one? And the answer is definitely yes. So yeah. our main, like our daily driver credit card is our Chase Sapphire Reserve. We just love this card. It's got great protections on it. There's no international transaction fees. It's, it's... got priority pass, lounge access. <laughs> yeah, and the Chase points are so valuable. Listen. I know that we've been beating this drum a lot, but we talk about this in great depth over hours on our Skillshare course about credit card churning. So if you want to check it out, you can check it out for free. Links down below. But the answer is yes, we have an IHG card, a Chase Sapphire Reserve, an American Airlines card, and a couple other ones. <laughs> we've had the whole gamut. <laughs> Which VPN are you using? So as a uh, former head of IT, I think about this and cybersecurity all the time. 
all the time. This is nonstop what I'm thinking about. So we use NordVPN right now, but we don't really use it all the time. And that's because of the magic of HTTPS. So you know, so you know when you type into the browser thing, like you go to google.com and there's a little like lock icon on the left? It's actually encrypting the data between your laptop and the website. So you're pretty safe there. But that being said, truly, the only way to feel really secure about this is to make sure that you change all of your passwords for everything before you leave and then put them in a password manager that's secure. <laughs> now I'm talking to you out there the people who have used the same password of like, let's say your dog's name is Bob Barker, which is a great name for a dog. <laughs> That's, and all of your passwords are just Bob Barker one, Bob Barker two, Bob Barker chase, Bob Barker chase exclamation point. Yes, I'm talking to you out there. Those are not good passwords. Not and for good those passwords. of you that keep it in a Google Doc oh, or a sticky note on me. your laptop. No, no. No, the best security that you can get, the best thing you can pay for, I mean, a VPN is good, but what's really secure is just enabling two-factor authentication and then changing your passwords to something that goes inside of a password manager that's secure that only you can access. But I think the bigger risk for all of us while we're traveling and or just generally in life is that most of us use very lazy, very short, very easy to guess passwords that once you get them, since they're so similar to all your other passwords, There'll be anyone who gets into your email will be able to get into everything else that you have because Bob Barker one will be your password for your email and then Bob Barker two will be your password for your bank. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> the most important thing that you can do is make all your passwords secure and make sure to put them in a real secure password manager. A VPN is a nice additional layer to that security onion. And honestly, they're not that expensive. It might be a good idea. NordVPN has been great for us. You can use pretty much any of them and one password for our password manager. Okay, uh, IT person Josh, uh, back into play here with this one, so. I'm gonna go over here <laughs> for a second. So what do you do about your, your cell phone? What do you do about your cell phone plans? This is a great question, and another one that I spent a lot of time thinking about, and I think that I've come to like the best two solutions, although now it's really one because the other one's disappeared, that, are really viable for traveling around the world and not spending a gajillion dollars on your cell phone plans if you're from the US. If you're not from the US, this will probably be different. All of our banks everywhere require two-factor authentication and the only option that most of them give you is to send you a text message. That's super annoying, especially if you're traveling overseas for a long period of time because it means that you have to keep your US cell phone number and somehow be able to access it from abroad. Now there are some options here, like AT&T or T-Mobile or whatever have plans that allow you to do this, but they charge you $10 per day and usually give you very slow, very expensive data while you're doing it. This is one option, but it's not really an option because there's no way you're going to spend $3,000 on your cell phone plan while you're traveling. It just, uh, no. So the other option that used to be great was a service called Google Fi. And this service still exists. And what you can do is you transfer your number to it and it works anywhere in the world for $20 per month plus $10 per gigabyte of data that you use. They have unlimited plans for like 70 bucks a month. It's kind of expensive, but it worked all right. And this meant that you could get text messages and you could use your phone, whether it was an iPhone or Android, just basically like you were in the US, but you would have data everywhere that you went. What they're doing now and what just happened with Lisa's phone is they're actually cutting off the data plans of people who are full-time traveling and who are using their data on Google Fi elsewhere in the world. Now, what they're not doing is cutting off the text messaging. So you could still just pay the base $20 a month and leave your phone number with Google Fi and then buy some sort of local SIM card wherever you are. This is a pretty good option. It's definitely the simplest of all the options. You just port your number to Google Fi like it's Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile or whatever, send it over to them, and then you just have this Google Fi SIM card that you bring with you everywhere. And then for data, which you won't be able to use, on Google Fi, you just buy a local SIM card. The solution that I went to is I actually transferred my number to a different Google service called Google Voice. What this does is this takes your phone number and brings it into this online web platform where any place that you have access to the internet, you can go to voice.google.com and you'll be able to see the text messages that came into your US phone number no matter where you are in the world. You can also make phone calls from this service. 
It costs nothing except for the porting fee. It costs $20 to move your phone number from wherever it is over to Google Voice. And so far this has been working great for getting these text messages from my banks and from my credit cards and other things like that so that way I can actually access these things while I'm on the road. Another option that we're trying out right now is a service called Tossable Digits. This service for us is costing $7 a month and that's what we just transferred Lisa's phone number over to it. But truthfully, we've only had it for a couple days. I don't know if I can recommend it or not, but it exists and we'll provide an update on this once we've tried it for a little bit longer. And then what we do besides that is we either use a eSIM service, which is just an electronic SIM, not a physical chip. You just like install a piece of software on your phone called Aralo, and then you just buy a data package for whichever country that you're in once you get there and then boom, you're connected and you have cell phone data and then you use that to connect back to Tossable Digits or Google Voice to be able to actually receive those text messages. Or, or you could just buy a SIM card in whichever country that you're in. This is a little bit more of a pain because you have to buy a new one every new country that you go to, but it's a pretty cheap option and data is significantly cheaper almost everywhere else that you go than it costs in the United States. So those are kind of all the options. The one that I would most recommend is transfer your number from where it is to Google Voice right before you leave on your trip and then just buy local SIM cards everywhere that you go. Okay. Okay, and also looking back from our first video, the big change video, we had some questions that were really good there too. So one of the questions was, have you ever been bored or tired from traveling? Heck yes. <laughs> yeah. I would say that we're that we're burned out right now. This is a very like yeah. right now question for us of that yeah, we're we're kind of burned out from traveling. This camper van experience that we just got done with is just kind of ruin the fun for us and we're trying to get our mojo back. I think there's this idea, especially when you go onto Instagram and YouTube, that traveling is the best time of your life. And we've even said that in this video. It's worth it, it's worth it. And it is. But the honest truth is, like anything in life, anything long term, anything that you do all the time, you're gonna get tired, you're gonna get bored, and you're gonna get run down a little bit. So we definitely have times where we just stay inside. Or there are times where we just really, really crave home and, and are homesick. And the way that we combat that is just recognizing and saying, that's an okay feeling to have, what do we do about it? And for Josh, it might be his weekly hangouts with his brothers playing video games. For me, it might be participating in virtual hula with the girls back at home. Traveling has certainly added a whole new level of adventure and excitement to our lives that we were craving and wanting. But as with all things, there are always some downsides. But I think the key to all this is to create like some level of consistency in your trip where every week you set aside a couple hours to connect with your friends and family back at home. And I think not only does that alleviate boredom, but it gives you perspective. So our next question is, what do you do when you need alone time? So this is a good question for, for one of us. Uh, <laughs> bye, Lisa. So I generally don't need alone time. It's just not a, not a thing that I crave. It's not a thing that I require. So I'm kind of very, I'm definitely the wrong person to answer this question. I feel like I should leave. No. <laughs> We definitely, there are definitely times where I need alone time, especially when we're stuck. And I feel like you also too. Just the other day you were like, I gotta get out of this hotel room. <laughs> and it's not even really that I need to be alone alone. It's just there are times where I just need no extra stimulation. No sounds, no talking, no editing. For me, alone time just means being able to do a thing that I only want to do. There's no decision making involved. There's no other people to think about in that decision. It's just solely the time that I want to spend doing whatever it is that I want to do. How we deal with that is I just, I just say, today all I want to do is just draw. Or today all I want to do is just practice hula and that's it. And, and I focus on that set amount of time just for myself. Because we spend literally 24 seven together <laughs> in a place this big. Which is actually quite large compared to our camper van. Much bigger than the camper van, but it ain't that big. Nonstop, so if you need time apart, it's a reasonable thing to ask for. I just know that the more I've practiced voicing this and saying this out loud, the better it is for me, for Josh, for everyone else around. Last question here, we're probably gonna do another one of these sort of <laughs> Q&A things, so just leave any questions that you feel like we didn't get to or didn't like or didn't answer in the best way or the most helpful way. 
Just leave a comment down below and then we'll do another one of these in a week or two and answer all of those questions. What factors went into the decision to make your travels and lives basically an open book? Right, yeah. so I would say at first, total accident. <laughs> yeah. um, th that wasn't what we intended. It genuinely wasn't. We started this YouTube channel in an attempt to document us building a camper van and a tiki bar right next to that camper van. For, During the pandemic, when we couldn't travel. Yeah. During the pandemic, just to see if we liked it, just to see if we even enjoyed this whole process of making videos, and then almost 300 videos later, we're still doing it. It's time. It's Travel Story Thursday. Travel Story Thursday. Sleeves all rolled up. Getting comfy. Ready to go. And the only reason for that is you. Mm you out there that's the only reason that we keep doing this the idea that we could have even a small chance at helping one of you out there go from like i'm thinking about taking a trip or maybe i'll quit my job someday but actually turning that into a real life-changing adventure around the world and leaving your job to do it because it's the thing that you need in your life the idea that we could even play a small part in that and help even just one of you out there do that is worth all of these youtube videos still Still, to this day, we love doing it, and it's all just for that. And this is actually something that we feel very, very strongly about. Before we left on our trip, and for me personally, I had always wanted to travel. I always said that that was the thing that I wanted to do the most. But instead of actually taking the steps to make that happen, I just spent time scrolling, watching other people do it, watching other people live their beautiful red dress and an orange swimsuit in blue waters lives and thinking that could never be me. Mm -hmm. When we decided to start making YouTube videos and documenting our journey, it transformed into this this goal, this mission, this value to not not create a life of FOMO, not not perpetuate the life of FOMO, not perpetuate envy, travel envy, because it's yeah. so easy to do and it's so easy to get caught up into. So that's actually one of the biggest reasons that we've decided to document this journey and make our decision making and our travel plans so open to everybody so that they could realize this is a thing that two ordinary people could make this dream come true. Mm -hmm. Just just in the off chance, it, it can encourage other people to do the same. Okay, that is it for the Q&A. This video is probably like three <laughs> hours long by now. Uh, so, uh, If you've stuck with us this long, mm. gosh, you're the best. <laughs> editing, editing this thing is gonna be a real treat. Um, okay, that's it for this video. Again, if you have more questions, leave them down in the comments below. Uh, if there's anything we missed and you want us to answer, we definitely will. And so, we'll answer it in a two hour long form <laughs> video next. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for watching and uh, we'll see you soon. Money. I need a haircut, don't I? It's all about the money. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> 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 I don't know what to say. Trip, 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 trip. I've said that word a lot. Thousand dollars a month. So if you're making a thousand, I hate this. I think the bigger hole that everybody needs to plug is that most of us have very weak. <laughs> Hi, kitty. What do you got to tell us? So many things to say. <laughs>